Well, thanks very much. We had a fascinating morning, and the second part this morning is going to be equally as interesting, I think. Um, for those who, was it last year, Christine? Yes, the, we had uh, another anniversary last year, the 50th anniversary of Ember Field Society. And for those who watched online, Christine gave a, a great talk about that. And to follow up, <laughs> um, I'll, well, I'll introduce you. Uh, Christine McPherson, the chair of Ember Archaeological Field Society, is going to talk about camo. And I shall try and load it up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. It is, of course, all his fault. <laughs> when he asked me for a title, I didn't have much time. I should really have called it the interwoven story. <laughs> oh, wrong way. Edinburgh Archaeological Field Society, as he said, is now 51 years old. Um, and this is what we do. We did have a visit from the Lord Provost, seen as we were denied our civic reception mm -hmm. due to COVID. I'm working on the next Lord Provost. <laughs> <laughs> our story started in 2017 when we did a walkabout in Camo as John had suggested, maybe this was an interesting place for us to look at. It's an estate on the outskirts of Edinburgh that had had no archaeology done in it at all. So an intrepid group went off to look. <coughs> if any of you know Camo, bits of it are tragically sad. The house is now just a stump. But the story of the estate goes back much later than the house. So from 1345, we have records. For some reason, the Bishop of Dunkel wanted it more than the Cramond Tower <laughs> and then sold it almost immediately he got it. Uh, and the Mowbray family took over and held it for hundreds of years. And when John M Mingers inherited it, he built, in 1693, Camo House. It was a fine house. He uh, didn't stay there very long, however. He was prominent in Edinburgh society and... Uh, some of you might recognize the uh, witch's memorial. He prosecuted a few of those. And once he'd lost quite a lot of money in the Darien disaster, he went to America. And uh, there, he prosecuted pirates. <laughs> this interesting looking gentleman was one that got away. He seemingly was the worst of them. He has a terrible reputation. I'm going to give you little snippets of the history of the people who owned the house and the estate interspersed with our archaeology. The little snippets are just a taster. If you want to know more, we'll get Anne Kerrigan to give you a talk. But make sure you've got at least two hours. <laughs> she has researched so much so the first thing we asked ourselves when we got there was, so where did it go, this house? <coughs> this fine and large <coughs> house. So we went to look for it. We had some useful plans, quite a number of them. We started at the back. We looked to the east and to the west in the undergrowth and we found the footings of the original walls and so now we're hoping to be able to mark out on the ground the actual frame of that large house so that people can be impressed 
because currently when they go, they just see the top. We found a few odd things. At one point, we called this the camo crocodile, <laughs> but I'm told it's actually an alligator. <laughs> but what it really is, is a cigarette lighter. It was um, one of these giveaways with booze. We uh, not only dug, but we did geophysical survey as well. Um, we're still doing geophysical survey and have a plan for more. Talking of plans, in 1710, Sir John Clark, who later became Baron Pennicut, um, drew this interesting plan of the ground. You can just about see the house here with formal garden, strangely enough, at the back. Um, he sold on, and a guy called John Hogg bought it. He was a friend of William Adams, of fame and renown. And William Adam designed this amazing idea for enlarging it. Unfortunately, Mr. Hogg, like Mr. Mingus before him, ran out of money, uh, but not before he had uh, invested in this ornamental canal, which was all the rage in garden design at that time. Um, and there are very few as well as this still running. The Watsons took over soon afterwards, and they were there for over 300 years. James, the first James, married the daughter of Lord Hope of Hopeton. Um, Lord Hope didn't think that his house in Softland was good enough, <coughs> so they had to move to Camo. James <coughs> got his own back by calling it New Softland. He also uh, was a bit of a lad and died in the home of his mistress in 1778. Uh, no, died in the home of one of his mistresses <laughs> in 1778. His son Charles, who quite often, you know, you get the wayward man and his son turns the other way and becomes very staid. Well, Charles was the staid one and he worked a lot on the house, building, starting to build the walled garden. His son James, possibly leading towards the <coughs> other James, more interested in the stables than the house, although he castellated it to make it look even more important. And eventually that line died out when Helen, the youngest, who married Lord Aberdow, died young. There were a couple of other people who owned the house before that, but the really interesting story comes with this lot. As you'll see, this holiday snap taken at Ostend about the turn of the century shows the Black Widow with David Bennett Clark the bank clerk who later divorced her, and their two sons, Robert and Percival. The Black Widow was actually a divorcee. Um, Bennett Clark divorced her after she tried to divorce him twice. <laughs> she went off on round the world tours with her two sons, possibly to keep them out of his way. Um, and when she came back, she wore black. Whenever she went shopping, she went in a car with windows, curtains, so nobody could see her. So locally, she was known as the Black Widow. Her older son stayed behind in California, like a sensible chap, and uh, he stayed there. She got, obviously had a big row with him and got in the hump and uh, just let the estate go to rack and ruin so that he wouldn't have anything interesting to inherit. She left the estate to her younger son, Percival, and when she died in 1955, he went to stay with the farmer nearby and kept 30 dogs in the house. That's one of the better photographs. 
I did have one coming next that had the floor surface, but I thought that was a bit much before lunch. <laughs> when Percival died, he left the house as was um, to the National Trust for Scotland. They had to come in with their old clothes and marigolds, uh, possibly should have been wearing masks. I don't know how many of them survived much longer after going in. Um, and the National Trust for Scotland realised that they couldn't pay to rebuild the house, so <laughs> they gave it to the Edinburgh Council. <laughs> <laughs> The Edinburgh Council found it had been burnt down twice once the dogs were removed. The vandals could get in easily. And so they got it knocked down and left the tump. The majority of the house is still underneath the tump. So having looked at the house, we moved on to the lesser beings in the estate. And we started looking at the vernacular building, the steadings. We removed an incredible amount of work. All this earth, the stones, the slates, the boulders. We found the beautiful flagged floor. We found the story of the last inhabitant of the cottages. Margaret Wright was the 70-year-old ex-cook from the big house. She'd, she was the only one on the estate in 1911. We found all sorts of interesting things belonging to her. I didn't show you the picture of the false teeth. <laughs> Being a cook, she had lots of utensils. And we even have a picture that might be her, which is really nice. She uh, was 70 when she was in the cottages in 1911 and died in 1915 back in Monimusk where she came from. <laughs> we kept a good re record of everything and we moved on then to the steading. The steading had been called the piggery by mistake. We found a machine base in it. Pigs don't use machines really. <laughs> At the back, We found a two-story park and lots of interesting finds here too. And this is what it turned out to be. It turned out to be a buyer. There is a fantastic stable block that many people passing by think is actually the house because it's so much more impressive. It's even more impressive now because Joyce has been busy with a team from the green team and from our volunteers clearing all the rubbish out of it, and we can now see the stalls where the ten horses were kept. Recently, we've moved on to the walled garden. It was started by Charles, as I said, and took ten years to finish. We found the bothy where the gardeners had their, I was going to say tea breaks, but I think due to the bottles we found it was more beer breaks, <laughs> uh, and their pipes. They had bee bowls, and now, back in that walled garden, there are bees, beehives, and you can buy their honey. What really caught our imagination were the flue houses. The north wall had been a hot wall. The uh, flues here were heated by coal and blew air into the wall, which was double-skimmed brick, and that's how they had a longer s growing season for their soft fruit. This one had been adapted probably in the 1870s by Archibald Campbell, the <coughs> brewer who owned it then, uh, and they put in a boiler. He also put in a greenhouse. The boiler house we believe was made by Monker and Mackintosh because we found out that uh, Alexander Campbell was one of their clients. 
here you will see us trying to find the footprint of that large greenhouse. 29 yards long, the records say. And we've found the pipework which goes under the ground to spread the heat for the plants to grow longer and stronger. In the earth above, we have a layer of stones for drainage, and then we have earth with large bone and con uh, <coughs> charcoal in it, again to help the plants grow stronger. You'll notice, I'll go back, that many of these people digging here <coughs> are a lot younger than me. This is because we have a good tie-up with the University of Edinburgh and their students come as members of the society and join in the excavation. We have here slate water troughs and we can see the footings of the glass house. Here is our latest find. We have found the edge of the glass house to the west and these ceramic tiles surround the glass house complex and they're really fantastic and this is the other end of the glass house which we will be investigating next. I would like to thank my committee Sorry, Deborah, we only had a back view of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank this chap. As I said, it's all his fault. He invited us to work at Camo. I'd like to thank lots of people, but I will just say that our new website is up and running, and please have a look at it.